I've seen it in other situations, not just an earthquake. And so you really have to be prepared if something like this happens to have a plan with your family even now. And and we were talking also about knowing someone and talking to contacting someone about this and telling them that you're safe. Okay, 6.4 magnitude earthquake, 10:35 this morning. We are now uh, going to a press conference that's about to get underway. Out of contact with Dr. Lucy Jones, uh, we'll be talking about, among others, about what we felt today and where the fault line was. And here she is, Dr. Lucy Jones. Actually, spoke with a woman. Uh, Susan Rogers, who said that she now has damage, she sustained damage to her home, but her power is still working. And we have Dana on the phone uh, from Kern County. Dana, what was it like there? I've seen some video online where people have, they've had bottles fall over and break. What is it like for you? Um, I've got all sorts of stuff on the on the floor. Uh, I, I just moved up here, so thank goodness much of my stuff still in the box because I have never I've been through a lot of quakes but that one just wouldn't stop and it wasn't just a, a one motion I mean it was like we had the bumping and then back and forth this for one moment at the clock out there and looking for surface rupture this is a large enough earthquake that it probably did break through to the surface of the earth meaning one side of the earth is going to have been moved up uh, uh, sideways compared to the other one. It is a strike-slip fault, which means that the ground motion was horizontal. Um, but we can't confirm that until we actually get geologists on the ground to see what happened there. there this is an isolated enough location that uh, that's going to have greatly reduced the damage. At 6.4, this is the largest earthquake recorded in Southern California since 1999. Magnitude 7.1 Hector Line earthquake happened 20 years ago. Um, that's the basic things I can think of. If, what question? It's not relatively long. Okay, yes. The duration of an earthquake is a function of magnitude. How strong the feeling is depends on how far away you are. The duration is how long the earth is producing energy. And earthquakes begin at an epicenter, but they happen along a fault and they start at the epicenter and they rupture down the fault. That rupture speed is two miles a second. If the fault is 10 miles long, the fault is the earthquake's producing energy for five seconds. Um, this earthquake at this magnitude, likely that the fault is at least 10 miles long, um, probably right around 10 miles long, which would mean the earth produces energy for five seconds, compared to the four, that was the four shock, would have been producing energy for a quarter of a second. So it, what you perceive lasts longer than the Earth producing the energy itself because it bounces off of things and there's echoing. I personally started counting, but I was on the phone when it started, so I'm not quite sure I got the beginning right. I got about 10 seconds of shaking at my house here in Pasadena. And how did you know? I felt it. <laughs> <laughs> Just like everybody else. Um, I, did, I did not have shake alert uh, the, uh, working on the computers at home, the computers here in the lab did give an early warning for this by about, well, be pretty, it would be a pretty long time because it's a long ways away. Rob, why don't you come join us? <laughs> uh, the head, the, yeah, he's getting briefed, and then we'll get the USGS representative here you as see well. The shake alert work. Can you describe a little bit about what that is? Okay, so if we see right here is our shaking distributions. Uh, we have a system that recognizes that earthquakes are beginning and sends you the information that the earthquake has begun and an estimate of when shaking will get to you, depending on this travel time of the waves. So the system worked and said there's an earthquake of about 6.2 uh, producing energy and the warning came through. Do we have a time of how much warning we got in Pasadena? Um, uh, and, uh, the final magnitude of course. Okay, so in Los Angeles, there was 48 second warning that the shaking was arriving. Obviously, it was not damaging shaking. That's one of the downsides to this only approach that we have. The farther away you are, the more warning you get, and the less likely it is to be damaged. And you said to experience some rare or satellites or something? Okay, so uh, how could we ever know there's an earthquake? We have sensors, they're called seismometers, distributed around Southern California. We report about 500. Uh, sensors here at the uh, Caltech USGS 
uh, seismic network, and uh, we, they are distributed widely so we can try and catch them. Uh, as soon as we get enough nearby, we can see that it's under, that an earthquake's underway and we send that information out. And in fact, one of the exciting things, these biggest earthquakes, they aren't at a point. So when we're trying to predict where we'll be affected, we need to know which direction the fault's going. We have a prototype system, and that worked here too, so we could, we got an estimate of the fault growing as it was happening. So uh, it's the first time we really ever had that work. Can we, can we talk a little bit about the motion? Like, to me, it sort of felt like I was on a boat, and I felt a little nauseous. I've heard other people say the same. Okay, so an earthquake produces energy out of many different wavelengths. There's high frequency energy that jerks you around, and there's low frequency energy that rolls. The high frequency energy dies off with distance more quickly than the low frequency energy. Think about a boom box. You hear the, the car going down the street. When it's a long ways away, all you hear is the drumbeat. That's the low frequency energy getting farther than the high frequency energy. So if you feel it is a rolling motion, you know it's pretty far away. So when I felt the motion, it felt pretty uh, rolling motion, and it lasted for 10 seconds. I could estimate that it had to be at least a magnitude six, and it had to be pretty far away. Right. Okay. So the basics of the earthquake: the earthquake is near China Lake and Ridgecrest, so the area to the east of the southernmost part of the San Andreas Fault. Uh, the nearest fault is the Little Lake Fault, and that it might be associated with it, but we don't know. Uh, we have to have a field geologist to tell us. It is a relatively uninhabited, you know, it's a sparsely inhabited area, so the number of people who would have received damage is much lower. I think we need to check what's happening in Ridgecrest and China Lake. Uh, damage reports do not come here. We are seismologists measuring the movement of the ground. Damage reports go to the Governor's Office of Emergency Services. Rob, can I ask you to come join us? Uh, so, Rob Graves is a seismologist with the U.S. Geological Survey and regional coordinator uh, for Southern California. So, um, and let me just, uh, so obviously we're here because we've had an earthquake to celebrate 4th of July. We're going to have uh, uh, people out, our geologists are heading out in the field right now to see if they can document any fault displacement. Obviously, if any damage reports will come in, uh, you know, this earthquake was large enough where the shaking could have caused damage. One thing I would like to note is that here in the LA Basin area, because as Lucy was explaining, the waves, the low frequency waves tend to travel uh, further than the high frequency, many people out in the LA Basin would have felt that rolling shaking, whereas up here in the mountains, people didn't feel it as strongly. So we're going to have, even in the LA area, we'll have disparity in, in terms of the reports of the shaking. I know it's still early, but um, any, any takeaways from this quake? And the <laughs> <laughs> they need to wrap it up. But it's not. <laughs> I'll let Lucy do that. <laughs> there is a definition of the change in the news cycle. Usually at this point, you're still asking us what was the magnitude. <laughs> uh, luckily, now we can give it an accurate magnitude very quickly. Um, uh, it's not yet an hour since the earthquake. One comment I would make, if you've noticed, we've had a lot of aftershocks. Now, those in general are not being felt down here in uh, the LA Basin. Up in the uh, Owens Valley area, I am sure they are feeling lots of these aftershocks. I haven't had a chance to keep track, but it's we've had dozens, I think, about yes. three at this point. Yeah. We will continue to be having a lot of aftershocks. This area is also... Uh, characteristically tends to have very robust sequences. Uh, the magnitude 5.1 happened very near this in 1982, and there were uh, six or eight magnitude fours associated with that event, as well as dozens of magnitude threes, and it went on for six months. So we should be expecting lots of aftershocks, and some of them will be bigger than the threes that we've been having so far. I think the chance of having a magnitude five, I don't, this is an off the top, not calculated thing, is probably greater than 50-50. Sometime this afternoon, we're gonna be having a larger aftershock within this sequence. Question for you, if, considering its location to the San Andreas Fault, is there any threat to the San Andreas because of this? No, uh, no increase. 
taking risk. Well, uh -huh, maybe slightly. Uh, but uh, we have never seen a foreshock more than 10 kilometers, six miles away from its main shock. And this is substantially farther than that to the San Andreas or to the Garlock Fault, which is another large fault capable of big earthquakes. That is significantly closer to this event and would probably have a slightly increased risk on Garlock. But I think the San Andreas is too far away even for this size earthquake. But just keep in mind that the San Andreas is an active fault, and so there is always that risk. It doesn't increase the risk. Yes. It also doesn't decrease it. Exactly. Can you describe the activity in that area in the months of uh, yeah, we I, we don't have that data right at hand. We, no swarms. Uh, no, no, nothing. Uh, yeah, so if you're maybe asking, if, we have had a couple of other swarms in other areas of Southern California in recent days. Uh, nothing like that was occurring up in this area uh, in, in the last uh, couple months. There was a 4.2 uh, just about yes. 30 minutes before the main shock, and that is a classic four shock. But I know that when I saw that page come through this morning, I went, hmm, I haven't seen Searles Valley in a while. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, and, and there is also a, a slight chance that we could have uh, an event larger than, uh, than what we're right. calling the main shock right now. That's about 5% chance for every earthquake. And like any other earthquake, this probably has about a 1 in 20 chance that this is not the largest event within the sequence. Um, yeah, uh, R O B and last name Graves, G R A V E S. Your title one more time, sorry. Uh, okay. Seismologist with the U.S. Geological Survey. Thanks. We're getting some feedback from viewers and users of the of the alert system, and they say that in Los Angeles it did not work. Could it worked. That it was not broadcast on Shake Alert. Yeah. The system worked, but the. USGS uh, parameters. Can you elaborate on how the system operates? And yeah, so I, yeah, and unfortunately I don't have the details as, as to what didn't occur or what didn't work properly. We're, we're looking into that right now. So the system actually did detect the earthquake. It did work in terms of estimating that there was uh, shaking that was going to occur. Uh, the signal apparently did not get out. So, uh, you know, the system is still being tested, we're going to have to uh, you know, figure out what's going on with that. Obviously, we'll have updates later on today. Now, I, I, I will also caught or, or point out the shaking in the Los Angeles region was not strong enough uh, to, to be damaging uh, in that sense. So, to be clear, the signal was supposed to go out. It should have gone out. Correct. Yeah. Wait, do you know that? I don't know. I, I, I want to hesitate before making any definitive statements until I can. Uh, Sort that out. Exactly. Yeah, but this. All right, the system in the lab works. So that you know, the, the physically it worked. The Shake Alert LA system was set up with agreements that limited which alerts went out because they we get a lot of false alarms at the lower levels. So whether or not the shaking exceed you know reached the parameters that should have been alerted, we don't know, and we're trying to find out. But remember, we're not even an hour since the earthquake. Please. <laughs> we there should uh, if there was damage in the LA area, something's really weird. This was not strong shaking in the Los Angeles area, um, so I would be extremely surprised if that were the case. Um, but besides, damage notifications do not come to Caltech. They or the U.S. Geological Survey. They go to the Governor's Office of Emergency Services. Should we be preparing for a big one? What should always be preparing for a big one? This does not make it less likely. There is about a 1 in 20 chance that this location will be having an even bigger earthquake within the next few days that we have not yet seen the biggest earthquake of the sequence. It's certain that this area is going to be shaken a lot today, and some of those aftershocks will probably exceed magnitude 5, which means they will become damaging. Um, we do not expect, this is far enough away from the San Andreas that any impact on that system will be minimal. I think this, is an, this would be a good time to remind you that if you have been experiencing earthquakes for the last 20 years in Southern California, 
you have been experiencing an extremely quiet time in California history. The last time we had an earthquake in Southern California above magnitude 6 was 1999. The previous decade had had about eight magnitude sixes. So this has been an extremely quiet, abnormal time. This type of earthquake is much more normal. On the long run, we expect earthquakes of this size. It's not even six and a half. Uh, the long-term average is probably once every five or 10 years somewhere in Southern California. So, you know, remember, this is more of what we should be thinking about. Does that average have more tension underneath it? Oh, no, I, I can, well, I argue. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would actually say it's, it's, it's about the same. As Lucy was explaining, this type of earthquake is more what we would expect Obviously, any earthquake that occurs releases some of that tension, but there's a tremendous amount that's built up since the last major earthquake, which was in 1857 in the San Andreas. So these types of earthquakes are kind of on the, on the fringes of, of many of the other more active faults. This typically, uh, this type of activity is actually very typical. Lucy, you said um, we should be expecting lots of aftershocks. Uh, if you could just walk through what we should expect for the next few hours and how, like, will it taper off? How does that work? Um, I, uh, <laughs> since I haven't had a chance to even count the number of aftershocks so far, I can't be accurate with this one. 